from Brazil, so I will say that I myself am from a, I'm from a pretty difficult territory, um, so I'm especially interested in hearing what they have to share with us. Uh, to tell us about how they're overcoming this challenge, uh, we have inspiring individuals from Ukraine, Kenya, and India. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Yulia Kichkivska. Uh, Yulia is Vice President for Management Education at the Kiev School of Economics. Uh, she's a civic activist in Ukraine and the founder of Open University of Maiden. She worked as head of the advisory group for the Ukrainian Minister of Economic Development and Trade and also with the free market think tank Ukrainian Reform Support Foundation. She has a master's degree in economics and she is also uh, an Atlas Leadership Academy graduate. Uh, we're going to have the speaker starting the conversation now and we're going to have some time for questions at the end. Yulia? Thank you, Lisa. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I hope it works. Uh, so, thank you for being here. And uh, it's pretty complicated for me, uh, like today, to say something about Ukraine because it's you don't have too much good news for you guys. And uh, I think everyone knows what is Maidan. Who don't know? Who never heard about it? Okay, so uh, I'll briefly start uh, about what's going on now in Ukraine and what are results after all events we passed through. So uh, actually the topic of this uh, discussion is difficult, difficult territories like, uh, and promoting freedom in difficult places. Actually, we don't have a lot of troubles now and problems to, prom to promote freedom or with any type of freedom. Uh, in Ukraine, because like uh, Maidan really uh, have done a big job with that, and we are really free to do whatever we want to do, to uh, to to speak whatever we want to. But here is like another story. We have like lot lo situation change. So let me start with uh, Maidan, and uh, Ukraine really have done a great work on Maidan, but that was not the victory. That was just the first step, and. Uh, uh, what what would have been done that uh, like civil society of Ukraine was really born a lot of uh, like thinkers were like, people united and uh, they were ready to to fight for their rights uh, as a result Yanukovych led the country but uh, I believe that the whole situation didn't change like dramatically especially because the system was not changed and uh, the rules of the games was not changed and as like you you will see it when i will talk about results and what we have today so uh like today half a year passed after uh, we received new government and uh, i used to work for government uh, for a couple of months and i understand pretty well what was going there uh, so nothing changed, as I told before, system was not changed, and just old guys who were in opposition to Yanukovych, but from the, the old system, who are connected with all the girls, came to the power. Uh, which means not a lot of things changed, and that, that's the first reason why it happened so. Another reason is that uh, during the whole time, the most important things for us is reforms. Now, if we want to like survive, we need to do reforms. And uh, like this government we, we we had like for half a year, they were absolutely not ready to do that. It was everything as about uh, populistic uh, ideas, about like doing, as I told to some of you, like pictures from economy class. Uh, flights uh, and uh, people really like that because you know it's not golden uh, flights or golden toilets as our pre previous dictator has something new you know economy class flights so proactive so like our prime minister received 20 percent of support in these elections which means we are in a big trouble with uh, this populism and uh, 
The third reason I see why nothing happened after Maidan is uh, that all of us are very tired and exhausted after all events. And uh, like during Maidan times when a lot of people were killed, uh, we, we were not even able to imagine that something worse can happen. And uh, the whole revolution was not about some political parties, it was about people who were fighting for their rights and their freedom. And that's really important because uh, that was not, not American money or like some pro-Russian guys like to say that. Uh, that, was, that was our money we invested by ourselves. So like uh, me, my husband, my family, my friends, all of us. That was like something like middle class revolution. And now people are too tired and uh, we, like I say we because I also feel responsibility, we, like me in person. And uh, you know, you should work, you, sh you really, like all of us are so stressed and exhausted that sometimes we don't have enough uh, power to control the process till the end. And okay, we made uh, Yanukovych left the country, but at the same time we, we received another populistic like, government and we just give them opportunity to do whatever they want to do. And uh, talking about now and our perspective, we have two incredibly big threats. The first one is the war. Um, Putin will not stop and people are dying every day. Everything is getting like, too personal for more and more Ukrainians. And you know, this question is very emotional for, for all of us. And uh, like just a couple of months ago, we didn't have even army. We had machines without engines because everything was destroyed, like before, before, like during Yanukovych regime. And probably it's hard for you to understand how it could be, but like volunteers built, just built the army. So like donating their money, like, uh, even for such things as socks and underwear for soldiers, you know, and to buy this, uh, all of us were buying the stuff to sleep, you know, when you are in field, I don't know how you, how you call it in English. And uh, so that's the one thing, and people are really very, like, uh, depressive about that. But uh, less people see the second threat, which is economic, very deep economic crisis. And uh, to prevent like our collapse, we need to do reforms. Like uh, when I was working in Ministry uh, like of Economy of Ukraine, we have uh, we had in main like headquarter we had 1,300 people. Like a lot of them like uh, were wearing really fancy clothes, uh, driving Porsche cars, uh, having newest iPhones, and uh, same time they their salaries was like. 400 bucks per month, US dollars, like you know what's mean. So we really need revolutionary changes, revolutionary reforms in public uh, administration, in uh, uh, tax, uh, like tax reform, uh, everything. And people do not understand that, like the importance of that. So like good example is that uh, some of Ukrainians are dying for freedom on the east side, east part of Ukraine. But at the same time, like nobody is ready to pay market price for price for gas, for instance. And like mostly people don't see any connections between t these two things. You know, so they want to have uh, higher uh, pensions and uh, all social payments, but they don't want to pay tax at all. And that's a big problem. And and, e and you should just educate people and explain them a lot, but that's a very long-term process. Uh, let me finish. It's always better to finish with some positive things. So I, I found out uh, some uh, positives which, which we have in Ukraine now. Uh, first of all, we had elections and we had uh, really 60% uh, uh, voters voted for pro-European uh, parties. No communist any more communists anymore. That's a very good news. But uh, talking about numbers, it's like forty, like maximum forty new people out of four hundred fifty who are really new and who really probably will do some changes and some reforms. That's one good news. Another positive thing is uh, 
activization of civil society. And uh, like being inside the government, I understand in uh, I just want to share with my colleagues who, who will need it maybe that like to be successful to implement reforms it's not just enough uh, to have like political will and political party and whatever super advisors it's very important to have like support from people like reforms it's not only about uh, up to bottom but it's about bottom up process so what we are doing now like we spend a lot of time to educate people to tell to talk to them to explain them and russian propaganda is very strong so we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer your questions after after panel. Thanks, Julia. Uh, our next speaker is Mike Rodish. Mike has a bachelor's degree in business management at NIT from Kabarak University, and has also completed the public policy analysis and research training at the Center for Public Policy Research in India. In 2013, he co-founded the Eastern Africa Policy Center, where he currently serves as the executive director. Um, thank you, Lisa, for the uh, introduction. My name is Mike Kertich. I come from Kenya, East Africa. I'm really honored to stand before you this afternoon. Um, I'm one of the few um, young libertarians in the Eastern Africa region that um, trying to spread the ideas of liberty in the region. Um, perhaps I could mention, uh, if you can allow me, um, one of my mentors is in the room, uh, Franklin Kujo. I got to know him in the year 2009. And um, he's one of the people who inspired us to, to really walk the path of uh, uh, liberalism. When we talk about um, freedom in difficult territories, I really um, wish we could say um, freedom in territories that liberal ideas seem to be um, new in the society. Not really difficult, because when you talk of difficult, I believe Eastern Africa region is better off than some of the uh, Middle East countries that you can't even speak, or you can't even um, talk of some words that they feel are not theirs, uh, the conservatives and all that. But um, all said and done, Eastern Africa region lies in one of the most strategic areas in this world. I believe and trust that given the right uh, kind of policy framework, given the right kind of uh, leadership, Eastern Africa region could not be <coughs> anywhere close to developing of a third class um, uh, economies. We could be competing effectively with the New York City. One of the challenges that um, perhaps um, young liberals in our region uh, is are facing is, of course, the historical facts that uh, the challenges that are facing Africa is can be limited to maybe three. One is lack of accountable leadership or leadership that really don't count uh, tomorrow's or the future of its people. Number two, um, the kind of resources that exist is yet to be exploited because of lack of those technical skills and um, the systems that we have are not really very competitive. I believe if we are talking about um, the African region, and I can speak for Eastern Africa region, we're talking about internet connectivity being um, available to less than 10 percent, less than 10 percent of the population. That is one of the biggest challenges. How should you compete in the global economy? Because as we speak, <coughs> there is no way, there is no way you can say you are an island right now. The entire world is a, just a global village. 
So for us to be competitive and for us to offer that um, uh, competitive services or even to be competitive in terms of the markets, we really need to have the right uh, uh, infrastructure one. We really need to have the right tools. So when we talk about uh, promoting freedom in difficult or um, a bit challenging uh, um, territories like what you do in Kenya, one of the things that will come into your mind is we are talking about an accountable leadership. So if this unaccountable leadership is getting somebody who is telling them, hey, you need to be doing some things right, you can expect some fights. You can expect you can't expect somebody who's getting the benefits out of the inefficiencies, out of the unaccountabilities to just sit down and see you spread ideas of liberty, spread ideas of um, accountability, spread ideas of prosperity, and this is somebody who is expecting um, maybe in five years' time or ten years' time to be campaigning on a platform of handouts, or a platform of bribery. And here comes a young man who is not really, he is not even rich, he doesn't come from those wealthy, wealthy names, and he's asking him to be accountable. He's asking him, he's giving him alternative um, evidence-based policy um, suggestions that he's telling, th that will uh, really spur uh, growth in the, um, in the society. So, of course, your first fights will be um, with the kind of political leadership that you, you, you're getting. Of course, um, there'll be a lot, a, a number of people that will resonate with, um, with, with, with your stories. There'll be a number of people who will buy what you're saying. When you sit down and have that um, um, sound conversation, they will understand that. But of the biggest challenge, of course, is that mm, the systems, the political systems that we, we, we are facing. And um, if you look at um, the African setup, unlike um, other parts of the, country, uh, of the world, in Africa, you respect age, not the content that somebody brings on the table. So if I'm walking into somebody's office and I wish to get 30 minutes to debate on, on perhaps uh, a possible um, uh, donor, but somebody who is 70 years old walks and says, I want to see the same guy, there's a possibility that somebody won't listen to me. Just by virtue of that, being a young man, is not, is, that is the societal um, upbringing that we are coming from. And of course, um, ideas of liberty, freedom, um, in most cases, most of the people feel like, ah, no, well, we, we <coughs> don't identify with this. This, our, social, our setup is more of a socialist kind of setup. So why bring us um, liberal ideas? Why should we change how we've been living for the last, say, 100 years? So these are the kind of the challenges that we're facing. But as said and done, we are not saying um, we are not being successful. There are great milestones that we've had so far in African, uh, in African context as far as spreading uh, freedom is concerned. Um, to, just to mention a few, when we started uh, in 2009, as volunteers and um, just being uh, inducted into the liberal world and all that. <clears throat> we were 10 of us, 10 young people from Nairobi traveling and now getting induction into this. Five years down the line, we started an organization, a think tank, and the movement is really growing. Um, we were able to visit more than 18 universities and university colleges. Uh, spoke to more than 3,500 students, donating books, li um, ideas of uh, liberty, donating books to them, creating student groups just to change the mindset of young people. And from where I stand today, the future of Africa is better than what it is today. We have hope more than ever before. We believe that where we're walking into is a prosperous Africa. Thank you. Uh, our final speaker is Kanan Drew.
Uh, Kanan is the founder of the Think Tank Research Foundation for Governance in India and has a Master's of Public Administration and a Law Degree from the London School of Economics. She has worked with the National Knowledge Commission in New Delhi and the World Health Organization in Geneva. Uh, she has also been an external consult consultant with McKinsey and a visiting scholar at Stanford University. Uh, Drew was chosen one of the 37 Indians of Tomorrow, featured by the India Today. <coughs> Thank you so much, Elisa. My story is about a life of a young woman in India. I don't come from a war-torn territory or abject kind of misery, but I come from a world where enforcing a choice is an everyday challenge. And I'm going to tell you how that story has been unfolding and how I see the future from now on. Let me start with a very interesting story that I, I kind of was discussing with my sister the other day. And that was about a scientific theory. I'm not a person of science, but this is what uh, she tells me. That there is a bacteria that gets inside an insect's head. And once that bacteria gets inside that insect, automatically the insect completely loses free will. And the insects start behaving in, in, in the way the bacteria dictates. Now there are millions and millions of bacteria in our body and we don't know how free our choices are. Now I don't know if this is true. In fact I would hope that this is not true. Because as I said, every single day is, is a choice that I personally make um, in, in the work that I want to do. Um, so I, I come from a very conservative society. I come from a society where you are supposed to live a certain way of life. Um, the choices are made for you. Um, the moment you start growing up, everything is kind of laid on platter. And I come from the society where the traditions have been uh, followed for a, a very, very long time. Um, but at the same time, India is a society where everything is possible. Um, there are millionaires, there are people who have lived their dreams. But at the same time, we live in a country of contradictions. There are places where, you know, uh, there is um, so much of... Um, poverty and, and so many people are suffering on a day-to-day -day basis that are on a sensible, uh, if you are a little bit of a sensitive person, you would ask yourself that what can you do about this situation. Uh, for instance, um, the contradictions that I saw growing up made me realize that I wanted to do something about um, the society that I was living in. Um, and I realized that justice was a very important virtue um, for any society. Now, yesterday I, I was attending a very interesting debate where um, the discussion was what is justice? Is justice equality of you know the way you live your life or is justice equality of opportunity? I think if you go by the principle of equality of opportunity, I think there are so many contradictions again in terms of how we exercise those opportunities for everybody in our society. I decided to become a lawyer. I decided to kind of be the one to find out for myself that how my society can be more just. Um, and when I started practicing in the Indian court, I encountered a very, very interesting incident myself. It was my first case. Um, I was very excited because, you know, any lawyer would be very excited about the first case. And uh, my senior lawyer had given me this particular brief, which was about 28 years old. Uh, it was older than me even. Um, and I was very particularly thrilled to kind of uh, fight for somebody who I did not even know um, uh, while I was going to argue. Um, the way system works is that you don't meet your client. You kind of, the case has been in the cold storage for a long time and after 28 years when the case kind of was put before a judge, um, we were supposed to fight it out, me and the other lawyer. And I prepared so hard for this case because I worked day and night. It was my first case and I wanted to, of course, win it for um, the client who was a bus conductor and he, he had kind of sued the government for the amputation of his leg, which happened because um, because of the negligence of the government um, and it was pending for such a long time and finally when the case appeared it was the value of the case was around um, $200 or $300 that all that he was claiming from the government. Um, I fought it hard and with the you know uh, the, the wheels turned in my favor and I won the case. 
Um, I was so excited and I wanted to kind of get in touch with the client and say that, you know, the case has been won. Now please come and we can claim the amount that you've been trying to claim from the government. Um, but there was no address in the brief. I mean, there was no, no phone number in the brief. There was no way to contact the, uh, the client. But there was a small address somewhere in, in, in the papers. And I wrote a postcard uh, uh, to, to, to that address saying that this is my number. Please call me on this number. Um, and we can kind of see how we can expedite the payment that you deserve. Um, after a couple of weeks, I got a phone call from uh, a random number and I picked it up and I, I, I kind of, um, when I conversed, I realized that the person who was calling was the son of the bus conductor uh, whose case I had fought. And uh, the person told me that unfortunately his father had passed away five years ago um, and that he had kind of not gotten his claim that he, did, he, he actually deserved. This kind of shook me up completely because this is my first case. I'd worked so hard for it, and when I saw that, um, you know, justice was not done, um, I thought that something, something revolutionary or something very strong, reformative, had to happen within the legal system, because our legal system is extremely full of regulations. There are so many vested interests, and government has such a strong. Um, uh, handhold of how the judges are chosen or how the lawyers are practicing that it's very difficult to speak up um, and then I decided to start my own organization and I kind of spoke up about the need for reforms within the legal system it was difficult because some of the people who were in the system were my own family members and it was difficult to confront the situation on a daily basis where you would you know have to confront your parents and um, when you're speaking up against your own people. Um, I think this is again enforcing of choice. Um, these are not easy decisions that one makes. Um, especially as I said, coming from a society which is very traditional and everything is kind of laid out for you, how you are supposed to live every day's life. Um, to speak up, to kind of follow what you think is right is an everyday struggle. And again, as I said, I hope um, that, you know, that sense of justice um, prevails and that bacteria story holds not true because it's enforcing uh, my own uh, choice every single day. Um, there have been many, many instances. One of the other examples that I could give is that when we started to work around more accountability and transparency within the Indian political parties, um, we would kind of get threatening phone calls um, every single day saying that you should not work on this issue and that there are so many vested interests who do not like to have more um, uh, accountability within the way the, legal, uh, the political system functioned. But at that time as well, um, for instance, I was uh, discussing with somebody that in the media something, a particular news story would have to be reported and the media would call you just the night before saying that this is the story which might be appearing uh, in tomorrow's paper and if you want it uh, published or if you don't want it published you need to give a certain amount of money um, so that uh, they can, the story can be um, you know not so damaging for you. Um, so those are the circumstances in which one has to work. One has to work every single day um, kind of facing these tough choices um, but then I think Persistence and the fact that you continue to fight the fight you want to fight is um, is important, and that you have to um, believe in yourself and believe that the change that you want to make starts from yourself. Um, it is through your willpower and and the fact that you are able to create a momentum around the work that you are doing um, that is um, that is something that gives wings to the moment, uh, movement that you create in, in your society. So for instance, um, now the legal system is opening up. There are more people who are willing to see reforms within it. Even uh, the people are more aware about their rights and that really helps the, uh, the movement around legal and political reforms in India. So I think as somebody has rightly said that you cannot hinder somebody's free will. Um, and you know that and, and first law of the universe is to give somebody the choice to decide for one's own self. And I think um, that is something that I would like to leave you with. I come from the state where um, the belief that you have to be the change you wish to see um, is holding true even till date. And uh, I would like to leave you with that, that um, once you start to believe in yourself and do the work that you do, um, I think you become the change. Thank you. Uh, we start with questions now, and I'm going to make one question for each one of you. Um, 
Julia, uh, you said that you don't have, it's not difficult to talk about the ideas of liberty in, in Ukraine. Um, so that's really good. And I would like to, to know from you, like, what are the results, the good results that you see in the short run and in the long run as a result of being able to talk about liberty in Ukraine? Oh, thank you for your question. Like, main challenge I see right now is not like just to talk about liberty and freedom, but influence. For us, as, like, to influence right ideas is the most important thing. And that's the, that's the sphere I personally feel responsibility. Because it's like, it's good to meet with your friends for a cup of coffee and discuss like libertarian ideas. But if you don't have support in Parliament, if you don't have this re reforms in the regulation, uh, it like doesn't matter. Okay, good for you, good that you are so smart and you have these ideas and you are forever visiting events like this. But that's a crucial thing. And the challenge I see personally and uh, on what like we are working on is how to communicate these right ideas freely to people and make them support these ideas. Let them know that about these connections between freedom and market price, between social payments and taxes. So that's the most important thing. Because like, what we tried, tried to do and what we've like, done successfully, we organized really good, pretty libertarian advisory board for minister, but nothing happened because of the system. At the same time, I have experience when uh, I fired a civil servant through my Facebook post, which was which which get really popular. I had like uh, something like fifteen thousand uh, shares because like that was kind of car X accident, and he was trying to uh, like brutally persuade me that he is so important as ambulance because he have like you know ID that he works for Parliament. And I just described the story, and I gave like a lot of interviews about that, and he was fired. So, what what's the influence? Like, what is the conclusion from the situation? That to implement reforms now, what we can do and what we are doing is to provide this bottom-up process to communicate people to have the civil society pressure. That 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 exactly what happened during my downtime. Just. Uh, incredible amount of people who were really angry with what, what was going on and who were ready like to protect their values like freedom yeah decision it, that was not about European Union exactly it, absolutely not that was about like freedom so that's the point and that's the challenge we we have and uh, of course it's really that's a good news that we can do it freely mm -hmm. and because like a year ago uh, you you definitely have some problems when you criticize uh, the government as uh, a president, and it was more complicated. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Mike. Question for you. Um, you mentioned that internet connection is really bad and limited in Kenya. Uh, could you share a little bit about like how you overcome that? Like since you can rely on that on that uh, channel, like how do you how do you do to reach people? <clears throat> um, when you talk about uh, the internet infrastructure, okay, we, we really can't compare the kind of um, uh, infrastructure that we have with other um, parts of the world. But uh, young people, most most of them. Um, of course, the, 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 the literacy, of course, in, 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 the, in the internet uh, is required. But majority of the young people right now, we are able to communicate to them, uh, maybe via Facebook, via Twitter, and all that. But, um, of course, we can't reach the entire uh, nation. You can't be guaranteed that if you go this particular um, side of the country, you're going to, to get uh, internet co connectivity. Uh, even at times, even the network itself, the, 
the telecommunication network itself. But um, somehow uh, our work has been uh, mostly successful in regards to uh, physical presence in terms of visitation and all that. Uh, so we do get in touch, that is one. But we are, uh, the comparison that I kind of that I was giving was um, the kind of where you can tweet now and have um, 150,000 responses in, in 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 say 10 minutes. You can't get such uh, kind of responses. Okay, thank you, Mike. Your your organization has a, a different approach from most of the, the think tanks in the Atlas Network. Uh, so would you be able to give us like your short elevator pitch about, about your organization? Yes. Um, transparency and accountability are two very important values in a society where you want to allow people to exercise their choice. Um, and the political and legal institutions that my country has are not yet mature enough to have um, the basic tenets of transparency and accountability. And I think what we need right now is institutional reforms. And institutional reforms um, can be carried out when there is a lot of consensus amongst people and people are able to decide for themselves what kind of institutions that they require. Um, so what we do as an organization is to create that awareness amongst people for them to decide for themselves as to what kind of institution that they want to have. So we organize public debates, we organize kind of, you know, conferences where people come together and discuss that what changes they require in the legal system, what changes they require in the political system. One of the things that we notice a lot is that there's a lot of apathy amongst the youth about politics. I mean, a lot of young people don't care. The word politics comes with a lot of, you know, norms of corruption and kind of cronyism and wasted interests. Um, it is this precise feeling that we want to change. It, we want them to believe that it is through these institutions that you can um, create a better society. So um, it is, of course, different because we have to kind of go one step back. Um, we need those institutions for liberty to kind of thrive. That is exactly what we are doing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to open up for, for questions from you. Um, please raise your hands and wait for the mic. Thank you very much. I have a question for you, Julia. Um, it's always good to have uh, insights from the ground and uh, um, um, information what what happened during this uh, this um, revolutionary time. However, I must say I have close friends in Russia and uh, uh, very personal connections to to Russian people um, due to my friends, and I have a different view about what you call Russian propaganda. And moreover, um, I'm an Austrian citizen. And uh, I know our history with Russia very well, and uh, together with our German, uh, together with the German history, I know that close and good relationship with Russia are crucial for peace in Europe. So I'm very concerned about the aggression which is brought now against Russia, and um, I would um, kindly ask you whether you in Ukraine have any plans for uh, negotiating peace together with Russia now. What? Uh, thank you for your comment. I I don't know like if you understand like what's going on in Ukraine actually. <laughs> um, if you need, I can after lecture like after our panel, I can share that Russia invaded Ukraine. Yeah, they took over part of our territory. Like Russian soldiers are killing Ukrainians. Um, they are doing like destabilization in the whole countries. Um, that's enough. <laughs> or. Should I continue? Like, and you know, 80% of Russians support his, their president. And it's not just about Putin. It's just about society, values of society, uh, about values of others. And if you do not respect others, if you do not respect uh, like the freedom of others, what are we talking about? I'm very uh, surprised to. To, to hear such remarks. Thank you. Uh, two questions for you. The first one is, uh, what uh, intellectuals' opinions about uh, Russia's, uh, uh, whether it called the interference on the Crimea uh, uh, issue, and what would be the next uh, uh, strategy towards uh, Russia's uh, uh, expansion 
um, ambition. And the next question is, uh, what is the possible uh, impact on Ukraine's economy after uh, the independence of the Crimea, something like that? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, uh, talking about Ukraine and Russian uh, relationship in uh, like economically, of course, uh, like a lot of uh, like Russian market was important for Ukraine, and uh, we feel like the pain of uh, like all the events in economy like significantly. That's for sure. Talking about Crimea and uh, like during lo a lot of time. Uh, we, we were spending like uh, taxpayers' money, like money from our budget, uh, to still to support people there, and uh, like Russia after just uh, several months has uh, started to, to 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 support the region, and uh, we were supplying uh, water, for instance, and some other things. Um, talking about Russia, uh, probably you know like Andrei Larionov from Cato Institute and he, he used to work with, as, as advisor to Putin and probably he could better tell what this, this, that guy is thinking about but uh, definitely he will not stop um, as Andrei shared with me like uh, he had this big idea to unite uh, uh, all post-Soviet Union countries you know because God gave him power whatever and uh, I think he will not even stop with post-Soviet countries, like maybe nobody knows. But again, uh, here it's very important to understand that the problem is not just about Putin. Because if the, the Putin will, uh, will not have like, uh, such support, he will not be able to do that. And uh, of course, like economic success, kind of, that was de definitely they they done some success economically during like Putin's time. So that also influenced. But uh, people like do not understand like the factors of this like economic, for instance, growth, and they don't understand like the perspectives in the future. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Hi, my question to you, Yulia, too. Uh, basically, I'm from Egypt. Uh, we got inspired from the Ukrainian people two times. One from uh, since five or six years ago for the colored revolution, 2007. And this time, my question is that now the country is divided already by uh, the Russian influence and the Russian uh, intervention in, in, in Ukraine. And as I know, the, most of the, uh, the uh, natural resources in Ukraine is in the east part, which is controlled now or enfolded by the Russian, uh, or the people who is loyal to uh, Russian government. So how can Ukraine reform the economy of peace or economy uh, in the future with the European Union? I know that the European Union is okay. 60% of the Ukrainian people support to be a part of the European Union, but the European Union didn't offer anything till now to Ukraine. So how can you deal with this problem or do you deal with this issue? Okay. Uh, thank you. Very good questions. Uh, first of all, that's a big illusion that our eastern part of Ukraine is uh, uh, very profitable. and. Uh, uh, finally, like people open their mind, they, their eyes, and they've saw, they seen that during like uh, te last ten years, uh, all uh, these regions without Kharkiv city uh, were dotated from national budget, which means yes, they are re they have rich resources, but they do like they do not uh, have like profits and incomes. Like country, let's t let's say that uh, receive like like nothing. They just dotate them. So that's a problem. But that's the biggest like challenge for us to reform the whole system. We have a lot of national enterprises who are doing not just unaffectively like like that's crazy. They are spending a lot of like taxpayers' money, and uh, people are just stealing stealing resources there. 
So that's a problem, you know? Like, for instance, Kiev, uh, in Kiev we have circa 4 million people living there. You have a lot of parking, like parkings to, to park your car. And annual income, like just uh, this year, uh, from all this parking, which are publicly owned, uh, was $40,000 per year, which is crazy. That's probably like uh, two days, like in real life, they, they could earn this amount of money. So you see, like that's a, an, effic an efficiency of the whole system. But during the Yanukovych times, the system was transformed and was vertically absolutely controlled. And the goal was not to build like prosper Ukraine or innovative Ukraine or effective, productive, whatever. The, the main goal was to have more cash flow and like and and just to still still money. That's it. And uh, this another be European Union. European Union. Here is another <coughs> story because good lesson we learned and which will be I guess very helpful for the rest of the world that. Nobody would, will care about you, like not you, like America, neither the European Union. You yourself should fight for your country and for your freedom. So uh, I'm very happy that people in Ukraine do not have this illusions that uh, good guys from sorry, uh, if like <laughs> say, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, uh, good guys will come and and will bring you everything. Like no. When we had this uh, uh, talks and about nuclear uh, uh, arms, uh, like years ago, like a lot of countries ensured our sustainable, like security. What happened? No, like we lost a part of our country. Like our country is not the same as a year ago when I was here. So that's a tragedy. But who cares? Who 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 done something significant? Sanctions? Okay. That's really funny. Yes, I feel like uh, Russians feel bad without uh, uh, sweet Swiss uh, cheese, I guess. But in a uh, global situation, like that was not enough. So uh, I'm happy that people don't don't have such uh, illusions. And I guess a lot of like libertarian uh, people here understand that European Union is absolutely not the uh, I don't know, El Dorado or wherever, well, so, <laughs> you know, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Do we have any questions? Mike or Kanan? So Julia can take a, a little break. <laughs> Which one? Right now, right now. That's a question. A thousand questions for Julia, but uh, I have also one for Mike. <laughs> 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 um, <coughs> You know, Africa is in such a dilemma, has always been in such a dilemma, you know. I mean, it's a continent where economies are growing and people are, in many countries at least, uh, are taking initiative, etc. But then again, you have a crisis here or there and it just brings down the name Africa again as now the Ebola thing, you know. It affects the whole continent again as being one that needs risk, aid and help, etc. So, East Africa um, is... Uh, has always been an area that had a lot of economic potential and uh, really sticks out as, a, as an area that has great, great potential to, to, to really develop. And uh, what we see in East Africa now is Students for Liberty, thousands are coming together and so on. There's a real reason, as you said yourself, reason for hope. I'd like to know what's the impact? Um, who are those that can bring that change, that growth, that you know, initiative to, to overcome that old stupid stigma? and really take these economies forward. What can Students for Liberty really uh, do? What, what can be the impact of those things that you can do? Okay, uh, thank you. The objective, end of the day, is um, to spur some change. Um, change, uh, especially in terms of um, uh, political leadership, uh, can't be uh, felt in a very short period of time. Who, there is a strat I believe the strategic um, uh, decision to have these young people have the right mindset now will create the best kind of leadership that we need in 10 or 15 years time. That first year student that is very active um, as a fellow leader right now will probably be a senator in 10 years. You can imagine a liberal senator in 10 years, what kind of change that will mean to this, um, to this part of the world. Uh, um, 
we believe this is the starting point, change of mindset. And that is it. That is the position. That is the point of change of mindset. Having these people in the right place with the right kind of mindset. And this is our objective. The change will eventually be seen. Thank you. My name is Jafet Omojo. I'm from African Liberty. I'm not asking a question. Um, I just want to um, make a correction about something I heard. Um, when you hear Africa and then you hear Ebola, then you begin to think that there's, you know, Ebola is all over the continent. There are about 54, 55 countries in Africa, only Guinea, and even when you mention Guinea, you have three different types of Guinea. So only the Guinea, Guinea Conakry, um, Sierra Leone, and Liberia currently have Ebola issues. So um, this is just a point of information that Ebola is not all over the continent. It's, it's just three African countries. Thank you. I wish, uh, uh, just uh, another uh, point, Kenley. I wish you paid more attention to uh, serial killers that are killing a lot of people every day than Ebola. We've got TB, we've got malaria, we've got HIV and AIDS, killing people every day. That should cover our headlines every day more than this Ebola. Thank you very much. My name is Franklin. Um, I suspect that the Ebola reference is not necessarily to make it look bad, but just to underscore the fact that as African leaders, we haven't, well, as, as Africans, and our leaders have been quite sleepy when it comes to dealing with some of these epidemics. Because as we all know, um, we invest less than 1% of our GDP into research. I suspect that is the, I'm sure, uh, Rena. And again, these this are global scares. So I don't think we should be worried necessarily. Uh, if there was anybody who is, should be worried, it should be me. I'm from West Africa. Even though there's no Ebola in Ghana, but uh, you can imagine the. In Africa. It doesn't aid the poorest in Africa. Yeah. It's fine. Sorry. Um, I think the situation is pretty much similar in India as well. There's a lot of foreign aid that is coming and the governments are um, not able to really benefit the people who it is meant to benefit. Um, and there are these are tough territories and one has to trade cautiously. I think the role of civil society becomes very important and how, how even media keeps checks and balances and kind of sees how this fund is being utilized. So these are, of course, very tough territories to trade in. I just received information of a very sad one. I wanted to share with you that Kaha Bandukidze just, just died. He was uh, Kaha Bandukidze, Georgian like minister, who was a huge supporter for Ukraine, like really 